I'd like to introduce uh, Richard Taylor in a second. He's going to continue his presentation. He's going to talk about simulators, panos for panoramics, and uh, virtual theater. Thank right. you, Richard. All right, so I'm here to uh, energize your enthusiasm about all the potentials of this. There's a couple things I would like to reiterate uh, that, um, that he discussed. And um, really quickly, if any of you haven't seen it, if you go online and go to Charlie Rose, there was a VR seminar he had on the other night where he had uh, uh, Chris Mills from um, Versa and uh, Neville Spateri from Weaver. Uh, Jason Rubin's the head of uh, studios at Oculus, and uh, Felix and Paul, oh, those were the main guests on that show, and the head of uh, the New York Times Magazine, who uh, they're starting to implement VR in journalism there. So that brings me up to the point when Stuart was talking about all the places you can go where people can experience things that they cannot experience in any other way. For example, we can take you now, today, to uh, a refugee camp in Jordan or in Turkey. And you can see exactly what that is like. And that's the kind of experience, the, the social experience, the spo social ability to take people to environments, people who are normally couch potatoes, and go, well, what's going on with all those refugees? You go there and see what's happening, you will have a visceral connection with that. Journalists are able to do that by having someone there with that camera and going back to the Times or whatever, and then those journalists can really feel the emotion and the desperation of what's going on in those kinds of worlds. But we can take you to beautiful places. There are camera uh, systems being evolved to be able to go underwater. You know, as uh, Stuart mentioned, you can attach these things to airplanes, to cars, to uh, I was just speaking to someone here, Brigitte, about uh, a, a, a dog sled race. You know, to, to put a camera on a sled in the Iditarod, those kind of things. But being able to have people really go to places they've never been um, is important. So I'm going to talk now about some other forms of, it's not intermission anymore. I'm going to talk about some things that I'm involved in developing. And uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is what Stuart mentioned about spherical uh, imaging. I have learned from the experience I've had from the pieces that I've done about where people really do look. And generally what he said about having an environment that surrounds you and that has a high enough angle of view from here and a low enough angle of view, that's where we normally look. One of the last places we ever tell stories is right there. And right there costs a lot of money. If we're gonna build theaters or simulators or anything that are not a headset, um, to build a sphere inside an architectural space or freestanding, uh, they're complicated and when you build a sphere, there are only a couple ways that you can actually create 3D imagery in a sphere. And those ways are, um, first of all, you cannot polarize uh, with projectors a curved surface. You can polarize a section of that, so polarization is out. You can use active glasses, but active glasses um, are difficult to maintain, they're expensive, and they work fine for a smaller venue, like this simulator that I'm gonna show you. The other a way to do it is with the Dolby 3D projection system where uh, the projectors are projecting two different wavelengths of light and that can be projected on a curved surface. But projectors uh, are one of the ways that we can scale up what is being done in this smaller headset kind of environment where, because again, what I'm really interested in is being able to be in an environment like we are here now, where you have somebody sitting next to you, there is a sense of scale around you that you feel like you're there, you are there, and you're sharing that experience with another person. There's nothing worse than a comedy by yourself, okay? But when you're in an audience, the empathy that you have, the emotion, and the sense of real scale to look around you. I mean, I love what this camera can do, and. As I said, it, that's a language of its own and you design for that language. Uh, being able to stream material from it, from live events. I'm involved in one project called Virtuality with a guy named Joseph Zaki, who's an effects director. And 
What virtuality is, we've done three shows so far, is we actually put an inertial mocap suit on the DJ. We tried this at the exchange, which is the EDM club downtown. And uh, so we put an inertial mocap suit on the DJ. He is driving an avatar that uh, we designed, and he is being composited into a virtual world in real time through the Unreal Engine, and that's being streamed to people with, with VR viewing devices, whether it's an iPad, an iPhone, or a headset. So it's a way that we could create these virtual worlds in real time that are connected to a concert, the music and the audio were there, and then you also take, like an Ozo, put it in the environment, or multiple Ozos, as Stuart was showing you those concert pieces, so you could cut between them, a director can cut between what's really going on in the environment and the virtual world that marries up with it. And you could design that so that the world that this is seeing, the architecture of the real space, matches the architecture of your virtual world. There, right there, is another way that virtual reality is being used as an entertainment format. And to be able to drop into an EDM concert, like Electric Daisy Carnival and that kind of thing, that, that will really rock. So, um, let me go to my notes. I'll start with middle C and work my way to, to E. Um, so, simulators, panos, and virtual theaters. So, uh, I'm gonna start with um, simulator. Right here, what you see is a concept of a virtual simulator. This one is using projection. As you can see, there are projectors up above there, three digital projectors. They can be the newest laser projectors. Uh, but you don't have a huge throw. That is approximately, um, that's a smaller version, but the version that we're designing is uh, six meters in diameter, uh, 12 feet high, 210 degrees around you. The reason it's 210 degrees is because in telling stories, you can look ahead, left and right, but if somebody says something to you here and you turn your head, you need to be able to see them without them being cut off. So 180 degrees doesn't really work that well. You can see that wraps around you for the, for the immersive nature of the environment you're in. So this one is using projection and as you know in uh, uh, certain theater spaces you have to edge blend the projectors together. Uh, but I think there are limitations to projection and I will get to that in a moment. But what this can do, just to give you an idea, is you can create a simulator like this that all kinds of different things can be uh, played in there. You can play games where you, uh, and I'll show you some ideas of that. Uh, so you can change the devices that are in there and this um, world that you're in can uh, you could play in real time through Unreal Engine or another engine, the, the Crytek engine. Uh, all the video games that exist that we all play, Need for Speed or Call of Duty, those kind of things can be converted to 3D, dropped into this kind of environment, and with hand controllers, you and I can be sitting on a couch in there and playing these video games in real time. And these simulators can be interconnected through the, through the cloud so that you can be playing against Michael Jordan in his gaming room while you're on a cruise ship. And uh, you can put these things in, a, in uh, the places where they will be phenomenal because one of the things that we have a problem with today is education and the, the, the death of intelligence with these handheld devices is a, is a really complicated problem with children. They get bored really quickly. They don't like to read. So any form of device that you know, captures their attention, so education, put these in a library. Put them in a natural history museum. Put them in, um, you can obviously put them in arcades and malls and homes. It goes on. Um, but the interconnectivity of them is phenomenal because then you can have, the, you can put a virtual aquarium there, be it, be it a, 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 a real virtual part of the world that you've gone out and shot with a camera system, uh, or it could be a Jurassic underwater world, and it could be a 
simulcast from the Cousteau Foundation to the world where the, uh, you know, a spokesperson stands there and explains to you the incredible problems in the oceans from the plastic to the pollution and all of that. So the interconnectivity of these things is important. Um, so we can play, so obviously games like this, you can play in 3D totally surrounding you. And you can be, as I showed in the picture of the simulator, you can put different devices in there to, uh, you know, create motion. Uh, and there are lots of different types of, you know, uh, animated seating devices. And, uh, but the other things we can do, of course, uh, are, there we are, there we're sitting in a couch and you're playing a, a, a science fiction game, you know, um, you know, uh, you can name any of them. Um, you can actually do exercise games or play tennis. You're actually hitting a, a, a CG ball and there's a way we worked out to design a racket that literally when you hit the ball it pulses in your hand and the angle of uh, the, the swing creates the curvature on the ball and all that and you play against either a real person in their simulator or you can play against a virtual uh, player. Uh, so obviously um, music uh, and exercise games, all that kind of thing can be uh, uh, played in these simulators. Now I'm going to talk about virtual theaters. Um, this is a design that we've been working on for several years and this is basically spherical. I'll get to where this is gone now because again, as I said, building spheres. But one of the things that you deal with when you're trying to create a larger space and you're using projection is that projection, the light drops off by the square of the distance. You double the distance, it's half the light. And you run out of light really quickly. As you all know, when you go to see a real D uh, stereo movie and you have those glasses on, you have glasses on that are roughly 50 in D. And everybody in the theater, you always are thinking, boy, I wish it looked like it does when I lower these glasses. If you're going to make photo reality, white has to be white and black has to be black. <laughs> if I'm going to create this gentleman sitting here, and I believe it, that your mind, just like the things that Stuart were, were mentioning, your mind knows. And uh, again, it's my desire to create photoreal human beings that you absolutely believe. The world wants to see, and it's totally obvious from um, the Musion effect that you know was used first with Tupac Shakur at Coachella, but it did Michael Jackson at the Billboard Awards, and now they're doing reproductions of Judy Garland and um, so forth. But that is a really uh, one-note pony, because it is not really a hologram, by the way, and actually they've been now, uh, there's a suit against them, they can't say it's holographic, but it's not a hologram. In any case, it's projection onto a surface that uh, the image shows up once the light hits it, but it isn't opaque. If someone walks behind it, it's translucent. It's not really 3D, and you have an angle of view like the virtual televisions that you sit in front of that have lenticular screens and so forth, the latest ones being an NAB. Uh, they work within like a 25 degree angle. As soon as you get to the side, you go, oh, it's on a, it's on a, you know, it's Pepper's ghost, okay? So, but look how much money they are making and, uh, you know, how prolific that's becoming because the world wants to see famous people recreated and that is going to happen and we can make now uh, with the technology I'm going to show you here, a real human being standing there that you absolutely believe, and when you move around them, you're changing perspective on them. Um, so we could make the rat pack at the Sands Hotel, and you could experience that like being there, uh, but you got to keep them at real human scale or they're not real. So we can recreate Pavarotti, you know, uh, on stage or the Beatles at Royal Albert Hall or Elvis, and it is going to be possible. And it, at uh, GDC this year, uh, the Unreal group um, showed a piece um, from a game where 
you're driving in real time, just like the thing I mentioned with virtuality, you're driving an actor, a CG character, uh, with mocap in real time, and you can do facial mocap, especially if you do the models and do the blends, so you have a, a, a really refined face, so that you could actually do close-ups, that person can come up to camera, which she did in that particular demo. It was quite impressive. The audience could see her standing over here in mocap with a facial mocap camera on her and the markers. And uh, there was a you know about a two-second delay, but basically, she moved around and can do uh, these different, uh, uh, you know, interact in real time. And so we can and will be able to create CG characters that are photoreal that can be driven in real time with facial and full body mocap that can interact with a real person standing on stage. So you could have Frank Sinatra do a duet with Pink and you would believe it. Um, that's going to happen. Um, uh, there's one other thought I just thought of uh, what Stu was talking about, and that is uh, with cameras like this, when you have uh, virtual cameras, three space cameras, and you take them out in the world and start moving them around, that is entirely different, of course, than the camera sitting there and things moving around. When you start moving that camera, that doesn't mean that you can't look around. So in that virtuality thing for uh, for EDM, we basically, I programmed camera moves through the, the CG environment, but they're nice and drifting to get you to other points of view, but as you're floating there, you can look around and look at that world. You're not limited to looking where the camera goes. And also, the ability to look at what you're shooting with this camera is significant. But one of the things about a VR camera is that it is seeing the whole world. So there's not much of a guess about what you're seeing. Okay, I mean, it's seeing everything. So, but when you start moving it and why you move it, you know, it's good to have a reason to move it. But again, when it's moving, you can look around. So this was a configuration here where uh, the audience could sit on an incline. First of all, so you can look left, right, and down. The lower the undercut, the closer images can come to you. Um, but to build this is expensive and, uh, complicated. Here's the other configuration. I could create a virtual aquarium, which, by the way, is something that's also going to happen because of the Blackfish uh, film that um, really hit hard on all of the uh, marine parks. Their attendance dropped off massively. There's no reason that we can't create a virtual aquarium that the audience is surrounded by, you know, orcas or any other um, marine life. Uh, th some of that can be shot for real on real locations and composited with CG or it can be entirely shot on location, any combination thereof. Here's a freestanding dome. You can see the scale of people down there if one wanted to do that. But in a virtual um, theater, you can be um, <clears throat> there at the event in a way. So motorcycles are flying over you or you're in the winter games, you know, inside a dome that's there that Red Bull or someone else sent, so you can go in there and really see this stuff <coughs> flying around you. And you can take you to the Red Bull air races with those things zinging by you. Uh, I was called just yesterday about a group that has one of these planes that races in this, and they're interested in shooting with the Ozo uh, mounted on one of the racing planes and probably we'd put an ozo on the top of it and on the bottom and mix them together. We don't want to put the ozo in the cockpit. You're, you know, what do you see? You see the inside of a cockpit. So, uh, and if all of you who have seen Omnimax and so forth, the McGilvery Freeman films that were some of the first things that came out in Omnimax, you know, you can mount cameras on airplanes and other boats and things in places that are really magical. But in a virtual theater, there's the audience sitting there and I can take you to the top of Mount Everest when Hillary first, I mean, uh, uh, when it was first climbed. Um, here is a little example I just, we threw together to give you an idea of what can be happening in a theater. There's that golf piece you saw, but there's an audience there that's uh, looking at this. Part of the idea behind this whole golf thing 
is to create a virtual tour of the master's golf course through time. Each six holes is a different era because all the data exists for what it looked like and the contours and all that. So we could literally take you uh, on a virtual tour of the master's golf course and it would change every six holes to a different era and we could recreate just like that golfer uh, was hitting that shot we could recreate famous shots that happened along the way gene saracen's double eagle in 1938 um, and the other thing that Stuart mentioned is putting these cameras at sporting events to put uh, uh, one of these cameras on each tee box at the masters, and in places that even the people, the patrons that are there can't go. So you could see, you know, uh, uh, Roy McElroy or anybody else teeing off and have that as a live feed. But obviously, at soccer arenas, well, all sports, being able to be there and, and have that stuff streaming in real time, it's going to happen. Um, so... As I said, we can make photoreal human beings. We've done it for quite some time now. So, I mean, Gollum was the first one, but he was a caricature in a way. But to make a real believable human being, obviously Benjamin Button was one of the first. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, we've made lots of photoreal human beings that are in films that you don't know. But this Paul Walker uh, feat in Fast and Furious 7, he was in 266 shots mixed in with shots that they shot of him while he was still alive, and you cannot tell. You cannot tell. Uh, I mean, and you're talking about close-ups, you're talking about, uh, you know, every aspect. There was no limitation to what he did. So here is a larger kind of scale of thing, like uh, this is a pano uh, that could seat, you know, what is that, I don't know, that many people. Um, and as you see, it's a cylinder. It is not a sphere. The thing about a cylinder is that it only has one curve to it, uh, and architecturally, it's infinitely easier to build or to fit into uh, a building or to have it freestanding and move them. Um, and you can scale this up or down. So you can make a bigger one or smaller one. <clears throat> but one of the things to remember about any of these environments is what you are seeing is what the software creates. And I'm going to talk about it in a minute, how you could literally have a rectangle. And how many people here know what a cave is, where they've created uh, with projection in a square room, an environment that you can go in and interact with. But it's, it's a cube. But the illusion doesn't work entirely because you're using projection. And when it gets to the corners, there's problems. So if you create a cylinder, it's easy to build architecturally and um, relatively easy to project on. In that first thing I showed you of a simulator, there was a curvature like that because it was based for a projection. But I've totally come to the conclusion that you don't need that curvature because the software, the imagery that you're generating, <clears throat> the shader, is what you see. So again, when you're in a virtual environment, the smaller or the larger, what you see is infinite. It has nothing to do with the shape of the object you're in. So there, for example, we could put you in a virtual environment like that, standing or sitting. <clears throat> and those whales are, um, are there, around you, over you, around you. So right now you're seeing these, uh, all these environments as projection. So here, there's a virtual aquarium. And the aquarium could be any place in the world now, under the Arctic at the Galapagos Islands, at the Great Barrier Reef, or we could create a Jurassic world. And believe me, if we made a virtual Jurassic Ocean, they're going to be lined up around the block. Everybody loves dinosaurs in any form. So what uh, Three Space VR is doing is we have in the works uh, eliminating projectors, the way to really create visions and this is going to be uh, projection is old school even the, the highest end laser projectors by Barco or um, Christie they uh, they are projectors one thing about laser projectors of course is they have infinite focus 
but they are laser projectors and you do have to marry them together and any projector requires maintenance you have to color correct and marry them up the edge blending all of that is a part of it the maintenance on them the heat the size of them all those things are a part let's say <clears throat> that we eliminate projectors and we go to creating a solid state LED uh, environments so that the inside of that pano that you just saw is uh, LED. It's not projection. Now, if you, right here is a picture I shot at NAB of a screen that was roughly 18 feet high by about 40 feet wide. Uh, and I just stood there and shot a picture of it. It is totally photoreal. Uh, that is an 8K image made with 1.2 millimeter LED. So LED can be active or it can be polarized and we're working on creating polarized LED. What's wonderful about that simulator that I talked about when it's a cylinder is that can be active LED. <clears throat> so again, we eliminate the, uh, we eliminate the projection and you're wearing active glasses and it's, um, you know, 120 megahertz, photoreal at 48 frames a second, 60 frames a second. With LED, there is no limit to the frame rate. There's no limit to the resolution. The pitch of the LED has everything to do with how far away it is from the viewer. If uh, I'm looking at that wall over there, that could be four, five, six millimeter, and there'll be no pixels. With 1.2 millimeter LED, when it's 10 feet away, there are no pixels. The blacks are black and you have more white than you ever need. And when you polarize it, <clears throat> you can wear polarized glasses that are super lightweight with large lenses <clears throat> that are only 20 in D. So you can have them on, you could walk in here and have them on, walk into a theater and instead of walking into a theater and going, oh, it's a dome and we're gonna turn out the lights and then it's gonna be something else. When you walk in, the illusion is already there. Now, the implications of that in themed entertainment <clears throat> walking through an environment where um, on this wall over here is a screen of some shape and it's polarized LED <clears throat> and it is photoreal and it marries up with the real dimension around you. You're wearing these 20 ND glasses so you can see very well. There you go. That's mixing reality in a way that will blow your mind. So this picture right here, that's just a woman standing in front of that screen. And she's there <clears throat> so the resolution is there and there are companies now making down to 0.5 millimeter LED <clears throat> at NAB I uh, this was 1.2 millimeter but there was 0.9 millimeter uh, at a couple of different uh, venues so the future of uh, entertainment the next entertainment format is right at the horizon the tsunami of virtual reality is upon us, and this camera here is on the top of the crest of the very first wave, because it, it's a, a tool that you can all use and go out there and start to understand how to shoot with it and how to create with it. One of the things that's gonna be really fun is to take this camera, shoot elements, take them into post, composite things into them, track elements and create you know any form of uh, composite uh, imagery like we do in special effects now so there are no limits to the camera systems that are evolving this is a incredible tool that is uh, going to teach a lot of people how to play this world um, and as i said earlier you have to get into a dance with your process for it to teach you something and that can be done now. But the next entertainment format <clears throat> will be virtual theater where, and it doesn't need to be spherical, it can be a cylinder <clears throat> uh, that is uh, very large in scale, but it doesn't need to be a cylinder. It could be straight walls down the side, curvature on the corners, square across the front. And I actually believe I haven't been able to do tests with it yet, <clears throat> but we should be able to uh, take a rectilinear room <clears throat> and actually turn it into 3D because with LED, these LED screens, excuse me, 
these LED screens, um, you can go around to <clears throat> 10 degrees, the 10 degree angle, and they lose no brightness at all. So they don't drop off <coughs> excuse me, when, you, when you swing around them. So there would be no corner. The, the brightness would not drop off in the corners, and therefore the software, the shader that creates the imagery is what you're going to see. You're not seeing the shape of any room that you're in. Um, so, um, uh, I just want to say thank you all for uh, showing up today, and it was great to have Stuart here and the folks from uh, uh, from Nokia uh, demoing this camera. I want to thank Burns and Sawyer and especially Bill Muir uh, for uh, being a company that's jumped on board and is carrying these cameras, so you guys can go, uh, you know, rent them and use them. Um, and uh, I want to thank um, the uh, Digital Cinema Society and uh, all of you that um, have helped put this presentation on today. So, okay, thank you all for coming. We have a lot of thank yous. I'll start out with Richard Taylor. Fantastic, huh? And our other presenter, Stuart English. But there was a lot of people that uh, helped uh, make this happen. Uh, Creative Technology Center, Michael Page. The entire team at Burns and Sawyer. There's a lot of names here. Jason Stuckey, Ramsey Abed, Kevin Stoppel, David uh, Pancuck, uh, Brittany Ekstrom, uh, Brandon Epperson, and Rosie Coronado. We have our own uh, volunteer uh, DCS crew. Uh, we have uh, David Malman, uh, who's our uh, vice president and events uh, producer. He was with me here most of the day yesterday, setting this all up. And um, we have uh, Mitch Goldman and Colin Sabala operating cameras today. We have uh, Christopher Nell, uh, who helped us with uh, keeping sound going. And uh, I'm going to thank him in advance as well for the post-production, because he's going to be the editor. And uh, uh, Mariana Ibarra, who is our, uh, our PA.